Welcome to School Talk. I'm Nadja Varney, your host. Have you been watching TV, gone to a movie, been on the internet, maybe even read a newspaper? Are you wondering, as many people are, are we in the phase of life where we're having an epidemic of violence, not only in this country, but around the world? Has violence become so, so commonplace that it seems almost normal? Well, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. urged people to use nonviolence at every level of human existence. And today, my guests are actively involved in studying, practicing, and teaching nonviolence. They're from the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence. Mr. A.J. Benton is the victim service advocate, and formerly he was the director of the street worker department. And Abraham uh, Henderson, he is the director of AmeriCorps and working also with the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank Thanks you. for having us. You're welcome. Okay. Um, you know, your esteemed leader, the founder, Tenny Gross, you yeah. know, he's been on the show in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time he just sort of got too busy, but I think he wanted to send some other folks up to talk about the Institute. Yes. Yeah. Um, with everything that's going on, you know, with Sandy Hook, I mean, we could name a number of things, the Boston Marathon, beside the street, the individual people who are being killed, murdered, and so forth, um, the Institute for the Study and the Practice, I like that name, um, f f of nonviolence, it's been in Providence, Rhode Island now for quite a while. Would you tell me a little bit about, you know, kind of what is it, what is its mission? Yes, uh, thanks for having us again. Mm -hmm. The Institute was started in 2000, um, only because there's, there's a lot of violence happening in the province. So a lot of young males um, between the ages of 14 to 17, 18. 14? And St. Yeah. Michael's Church, uh, which was started with um, Father Ray, uh, Mong, and Sister Ann Keith, uh, was doing a lot of funerals with young kids, and I kept seeing the young kids repeatedly. So they wanted to do something proactively um, to reach out to them young kids to get them taught in nonviolence. Um, Tenny Gross, which has been on the show a few times, came over from Boston, where he was original street worker and started the street workers program in Providence. And the street workers go into the streets where young kids are actively involved in, um, I guess you say, negative activities. And they go to them firsthand on reaching out to them um, and try to get them back into school, uh, just trying to get them focused on whatever dreams they may have. So this um, is kind that of, connection. It's kind of prevention then, more, yes. it's not only active prevention. intervention. Um, and also, I was thinking about. Um, how Dr. Martin Luther King had his principles of, of nonviolence. Yes. And I wondered, how does that get incorporated into your work? He, he used to speak about a beloved community. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that phrase in some of your literature. Yes. Now, how do you incorporate some of his principles? Um, well, based on the six principles of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, it's all around you know methodology of nonviolence. So one of the things that we do at the Institute is that we practice and we preach nonviolence mm -hmm. and we teach uh, folks how to use that proactively in their life um, predominantly with a, a high-risk population mm -hmm. like AJ was talking about before um, we have some folks that are, are in the community that are just looking for a way on how to navigate and live a proactive life they just don't know how to do it mm -hmm. and we figure that the principles of uh, Martin Luther King and nonviolence that's a perfect uh, foundation for mm -hmm. folks to live a, a quality life in the long run that, that's excellent. So you're not just going out there. You have a set of principles that you know are going to work from, mm. for yes, other people. Yes, we have tools where we can go out to reach out to kids and mm -hmm. <clears throat> protocol we have to follow. Mm -hmm. And we also have to imitate that with the kids. The kids, they can see that when you're being real, when you're being honest. Mm -hmm. Isn't and that true with kids? They, yes. Now, I, some of your workers, I read about at least one of them because he was written up in the newspaper, Sal Montero. Yes. And I know he was just in the wrong place, it sounds, from what I read. He was a 19-year-old and his 18-year-old, they had been at a party and they were going to steal a car. But his friend, when he went to pull the man out, um, Sal grabbed the man, but his mm. friend had a gun. Yes. So even though he didn't do the shooting, he had to go to jail. And he, it was amazing how you spoke of the father and the sister from the church. Yes. He ran into Quaker women. So anyway, mm. it's amazing how people sometimes from their tragedies build you know, into something wonderful. Yes. I'm wondering, um, AJ, what uh, led you to be interested in this kind of work? Well, just growing up where I grew up in the environment I was living in and how I was living at that point in time, I made a lot of mistakes being young. Um, nobody's fault but my own. Uh, I, I did some time in mm -hmm, prison mm -hmm. and 
during that time, I wanted to change my life. I don't want to live that lifestyle. Uh, I talked to you know a lot of guys just just coming up, and that that wasn't for me. I knew I was better than that. I knew I wanted more out of life, and I wanted I wanted that change. Um, luckily for me, uh, I was I got introduced to Tenny Gross, and I, I I knew people. My family knew people, and I was able to outreach and just and just make hard decisions at that young age. Mm -hmm. um, I got involved at the institute at 23. Mm -hmm. when a lot of my friends were still actively street involved mm -hmm. and I was one of I guess you can say the outcast mm -hmm. um, at that point in time that I really stopped that and started living a, um, I guess a positive lifestyle. Mm -hmm. it, it's amazing how that happens so you you become the outcast when you're trying to do the right thing yeah. and that does happen even in schools where it I was teaching um, you know they don't want to look like the smart kid mm -hmm. you know there's also a connection here with the AmeriCorps and I think I read that it's supported by the Corporation for National um, community service, um, na the core is national, and it's yep. a, a mm -hmm. community service. Um, I'm looking here. I think it has AmeriCorps, Vista, Senior Corps. Yep. Now, how did you become interested in AmeriCorps? Um, well, um, I was, um, I'm actually an AmeriCorps alumni. Um, many moons ago, um, I was actually a, a, an AmeriCorps participant. I did AmeriCorps uh, in New York. Now, is that just for young people, AmeriCorps? Anybody can actually join AmeriCorps. It's a, a federally funded program. Um, and it's for people that are basically interested in committing to community service. So they dedicate 10 to 12 months um, of their lives, 1,700 hours altogether if you're full time, um, to doing community service. Um, but uh, I was uh, an AmeriCorps uh, participant, an alumni, and uh, the opportunity uh, presented itself at the Institute for Nonviolence. They were looking for a director. I was already with the Institute for Nonviolence. Um, I was a discharge planner. I'm at the ACI, which is the prison in Rhode Island. Yes. Um, and then I just made the tr uh, transition to a director position. Um, but we have uh, right now currently 16 amazing uh, folks that are dedicating their life um, to the mission of nonviolence. Um, and they're working mm -hmm. at uh, the prison system uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, they're working uh, at the Rhode Island Training School, which is a juvenile detention center. And they're working at several public schools in Providence and the community libraries. Um, and all teaching nonviolence so, for the next 10 to 12 months of their lives. And you know, <clears throat> before we went on the air, we were talking, and I was thinking, your degrees, or going to school, and you know, graduate degrees in education and philosophy and uh, social work and all those kinds of things that you've studied, must really give you a background, a foundation, and to bring to this real practical world that you're working in. Now, I'm thinking about what you said about some of these workers that go out on the street yes. and try to prevent. Um, uh, how do you know? How do you know when they're needed? In other words, maybe you can give me an example. How do the street workers work? <laughs> street workers—they're just there. They—they—they they, they, they walk the streets. Oh, um, they do. Mm -hmm. So they—they they go to hot areas in the city where a lot of kids are known to hang out. Where, um, if there's a hot area where police are going, we target them kids. There's a lot of programs out there that's there to help a lot of kids doing the right thing. Um, we'd like to get involved with that 5% of kids that cause that um, a certain amount of trouble in that neighborhood, whether it's in that school, and target, our, and target them. Because a lot of them don't have advantages to get involved into programs because, you know, there's, st there's stipulations a lot of times. You have to meet a certain criteria. With the Institute, a lot of these kids, they don't have that positive role model. So we get involved in their life, and we're consistent with it. We don't just come once or twice and, and, try, to, and try to pull you <coughs> in. We're there until you're ready. Wow. And once you're ready, the door the door's open for you to come in and we can start and we can start there. But just letting them know we're always gonna be there for you when you're ready to make that change or you're ready to start doing something mm -hmm. positive in their lives. So our door's always open to kids coming up who don't mm -hmm. have that connection, but once they mature and they're ready for that. And that can happen between anybody in the age frame. Some mm -hmm. people are just now maturing at thirty who need that chance to better mm -hmm. their lives and better their situations. Some kids are making that change at 20 years old or 15 years old. It all depends when they're ready and we're not closing the door on anybody who's willing to come in and get involved and, mm -hmm. is, and get this, involved. This reminds me of, um, you know, in AA, they have a whole step, step six, mm -hmm. to become entirely ready. I think that's the problem in schools and everywhere. It's like, come on, shape up. Yeah. So where, where most people are running away from this 5%, you said, of these It's usually a small percentage that make a lot yeah. of the noise. Most people want to get away from them or send them to jail. Yeah. That's when you walk in. That's when we walk in. <laughs> Isn't that So we're dealing with a lot of people out there, a tragic time in their lives a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. um, but that small percentage is, is our focus, and we like to get involved and help them go into education, go into mm -hmm. schools, whether it's program or GEDs. 
You know what? I, I really appreciate that. It's because sometimes we paint a whole area in a, in a town or a mm. city with this big swath, you know, oh, they're all rotten yeah. kids over there, you yeah. know, where it's usually a small minority that's giving everybody else a bad name. Yes. So I really it's like that. A small, it's usually a small group mm -hmm. that, make, that, make that, that make that name. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about um, is you also advocate or you used to be in charge of advocating for victims. Mm -hmm. um, what is that about? Now, that victim would be someone that's been hurt by violence. Hurt by violence. So, so you work not only with the, to keep kids Yeah, so from the institute violence. is built, it works with both the person who supposedly did the shooting, and we also have a program within the institute that works with the victim really? of the shooting or the stabbing or when I got beat up or, or so. Um, so now I work with living victims, anybody who's shot or stabbed, I respond to the hospital within 24 hours just to follow up with them, to get them, um, a lot of people that, that's in the violent, that end up getting hurt, don't have medical. Um, and there's a thing called victim compensation, which anybody who's a, uh, who's a victim of violence in the state, there's up to $25,000 that they're um, able to receive for medical attention. Is that right, in Rhode Island? In Rhode Island, it's in Massachusetts too. Um, a few states have that, that pot of money for victims, and we go and we offer that. But that's like an incentive to get them more involved. Because a lot of times if somebody's shot or stabbed, they're most likely to get shot or stabbed again within six months. Well, because they, they have revenge. That's, isn't that what often happens? So we happens? like to stop retaliation. The retaliation. Also, that's what the street yes. workers do. And I'm, I'm still a street worker at hop. Mm -hmm. And that's, my, that's my, my incentive when I go to connect with them. But also just to offer that and get involved with them and pull them into the institute. There are so many programs and advantages of getting involved with us. But not only that, retaliation is, is, our, is our main goal is to prevent violence, of course. Mm -hmm. So if I can stop a retaliation within three days, most likely it's not going to happen. That is amazing because so few programs have that amount of follow-up. And that's with everything, drugs or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if a person's suffering from alcoholism, whatever it is, if you just do one shot, the yeah. follow-up is so important. Has to well, be we consistent. have to take a break right now. But when we come back, I want to find out how did AmeriCorps get so involved with the Institute for the yeah. Study and Practice of Nonviolence. Stay with us. We'll be right back. My life is full of statistics. Thing is, I could have dropped out of school and become one myself. But I didn't because I had people that believed in me. Here's another statistic. 7,000 students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. It's time that students know that we believe in them. Inspire a student and share your message of support at boostup.org. Um, now, Abraham Henderson, you are the director of AmeriCorps, and it is a national program. So I'm very curious about how you're connected to the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence. Um, well, uh, America, like I said previously, it's a national program, yeah. federally funded program. Uh, so there's a lot of agencies, a lot of nonprofit agencies um, that have applied for the federal grant uh, to receive funding so they can have volunteers. Um, the Institute for Nonviolence, several years ago, we applied for the grant. We were fortunate enough to win um, the AmeriCorps grant, and now we have volunteers at the Institute. Um, now, with AmeriCorps, uh, just like with a lot of our organizations, there's a lot of different branches in terms of their niche, so to speak, in terms of uh, what the volunteers do. At the Institute for Nonviolence, uh, our volunteers are focusing, again, on nonviolence, but high-risk populations. Um, high-risk populations at the Institute works with um, a lot of the folks 18 to 25 years old. High-risk population. Um, predominantly in the city of Providence, uh, connecting the cities of uh, Pawtucket, Central Falls. Um, but this high-risk population, um, violent offenses in the past, gang-affiliated, not all, but the majority are. So what our AmeriCorps team does, um, we have several branches. We have uh, an employment um, and education department at the Institute. And really what our volunteers do over there is that just when an individual is released from the prison system, they come to the Institute for Nonviolence and we connect them with programs, uh, like a GED program, so oh. they can further their education, um, uh, job preparation program uh, that we have at the Institute. Because one thing that we believe at the Institute is uh, recycling human capital. That's one oh. of the things that, uh, that's one of our Recycling strong foundations. Recycling human capital, yeah. that's an excellent way to phrase it. Yeah, so especially with uh, folks that are just getting out of prison, and we can talk about like the prison industrial complex, right? Mm -hmm. um, but 
we believe that recycling human capital, somebody that does have a prison record, that does have a violent offense, that's passed, but we understand that we, we can help them recreate themselves so they can actually be a product, you know, a, a, a positive product for themselves and their community. Because one way or another, uh, Sal talks about this a lot, um, they're coming out of prison. Mm -hmm. One way or another. Coming out, yes. In, in Rhode yes. Island, for example, the prison is less than six miles away from the capital city of Providence. One way or another, whether it's a couple days, couple weeks, couple months, or a couple years, they're going to come out and they're going to come back into the community. That being the case, we try to give them the tools possible so they can reintegrate as positive as possible and they don't reoffend. Um, but we have an education program uh, at the institute. Um, uh, uh, we have a, a job training program. We also have a school team. Oh, uh, you work in the schools? In the you? schools. Mm. Uh, because we understand it's not about, uh, I, I guess some folks could say it's uh, damage control. Mm. Um, we believe before that even happens, let's go to the elementary schools. Let's teach nonviolence at that level. So when they do encounter a situation when they're in elementary, middle school, high school, that they can uh, uh, combat that proactively mm. and not make a bad decision. Mm -hmm. Try to give them the, those critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, folks that are volunteering in the public schools in Providence, at the Providence Community Libraries. And we also have a programming team that is kind of like at call. So if an uh, organization uh, needs somebody to teach nonviolence, they're ready to go. Um, and that branch of uh, AmeriCorps at the Institute, they go to the Rhode Island Training School, which is a juvenile facility, and they teach nonviolence there. Um, they, they'll go to uh, private organizations and public organizations and they'll teach nonviolence there, whether it's for a day or for an extended period of time. And all this flows through the Institute? Through the Institute with, mm, uh, with the funding and the assistance with uh, uh, AmeriCorps. Yeah, so the AmeriCorps has really been uh, financially helpful to the institution. Yeah, exceptionally, it, and it's it all works to, Yes. Where do the AmeriCorps volunteers come from? I mean, how do they get these people? At the Institute, we, well, AmeriCorps traditionally, anybody from around the country can apply to AmeriCorps, first and foremost. Um, the caveat is that once they're done with their volunteer service, they get $5,000 plus towards education. Oh. So after they're done with the community service, they can go pursue education, pay their student lo loans, or get a professional development, um, a uh, along with uh, a living stipend for the year. They get it on a weekly basis at the Institute. Um, but AmeriCorps volunteers come from around the country, um, but the Institute, we like to mix it up a little bit. Like again, we believe in that recycling human capital. Mm -hmm. So we'll interview folks from around the country who are interested in teaching nonviolence, but would also take people from the community that we serve and hire them so they can also become AmeriCorps volunteers. So we have a, a pretty diverse group of volunteers uh, at the Institute through AmeriCorps. It sounds like you're doing the prevention that you were talking about at an early age. And with all the talk about bullying, this is such a wonderful thing that you're doing because certainly nonviolence would be something that would combat yeah. bullying if they had the skills yeah. and the training. Now, <clears throat> to either of you, there are critics of this kind of work. And they say, well, you know, the, the prisons are filled with young people, but they say, oh, you're coddling these criminals. You're not being tough on crime. Now, what do you say to these people? Um, like uh, Abraham said, these criminals, uh, they're coming out of prison. Um, I came out of prison. So if there was no opportunity or chances for me to better my life, to make better decisions or a program that I can really, a real program that I can really get involved in that's really going to help me make better decisions moving forward, I would only make more bad decisions. So I would only hurt more people or other people would only hurt more people going forward. Um, human beings, recycling human capital is, 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 is huge. Uh, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. Some people need a chance after making eight mistakes. It's not always that you know you make one mistake and you learn. You touch the fire a bunch of times before you actually know that it's too hot to touch that stove or it's too hot to mm -hmm. keep getting burned. You want better for yourself. So people make <coughs> a bunch of mistakes. It's being there when that person needs that when the person's ready to make that change and that door being open for that individual. So. It's a hu it's, this is a very human program, isn't it? Yes. There has to be all these volunteers and people like yourselves, people who go to the streets, go mm -hmm. to the hospitals, go um, and take the time, give up uh, a whole year's That's a lot of time. Um, street workers respond to the hospital 24 hours. Our phone, their cell phones are on 24 hours, so they get called in the middle of the night when they're home with their kids and their family. Uh, it could be Christmas Day or... New Year's Day, and mm. if, you're, if you're on call and, and God forbid something happens, mm -hmm. we're responding to the hospital for that individual and for that person. Um, you really have to 
really want to get involved and really help people <coughs> when, when they're at that when they're at that point in their life. This is it's so um, poignant to me because um, when I was teaching in Attleboro, a family moved there to get out of Boston mm -hmm. because she didn't want her young children to get involved in where she happened to live with gangs and so yeah. forth. And that little fellow, well, he was a little bit behind because he had been kind of in with, you know, kids that didn't want to study. Yeah. And we just loved him to death, and we did all kinds of things. And he went through, high, um, through our school. In fact, I got very close to the, the mother who worked helping people who had um, physical problems. Mm -hmm. So she had a big heart. In fact, her sister named her daughter, her next daughter, after me, wow. <laughs> which is because I have such a strange name of Nadja. Mm -hmm. It's but, a beautiful name, though. Oh, well, thank you. But the thing that broke my heart was he got up into high school and kept going back to visit his uh, father and friends in Boston. Mm -hmm. And I was called to, uh, heard about, and went to his funeral. Wow. He was shot gang style on his knees. And I can almost cry thinking of it because so many people work so hard. But see, what you're doing, if there was somebody in some place that could yeah. have intervened then, and I have to tell you, when you spoke about the relationships, and I shouldn't go on here, but um, there was a minister who was very connected to this family. And when he had the funeral, all these gang, his gang friends all showed up. I was, you know, it was a huge crowd. Yeah. They were all standing around with their bling and everything. And he, at the end, called for them to make a promise that they would not, because to help this family to not retaliate. Mm -hmm. And it was dead silent yeah. for a lot. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the leader of the gang went forward, and all the rest of them went forward. Mm -hmm. That was like the beginning, a small step Stop. in what you do yeah. long term. Yeah. I don't know what happened after that. But when you talk about getting in there, and being on call, and staying, what was the phrase you used? Not just. Um, Following. Oh, it's not. It's not uh, follow up, but it's following through. Follow, not follow up, but yeah, because follow we all, you know, caseworkers follow, follow up, up, but yeah. you follow through. through. I really like that. Now, yes. there are some people though who criticize this kind of work. They say you can't really make a difference till you get to the real problems like poverty and racism, and inequality in education. What do you say to them? You can't do anything. You know, this is not effective until you cure the big problems. Well, I'll well, tell you, uh, okay. I'll tell you what is the, the epidemic is. Um, there's a, a, a epidemic of violence, and we, we could discuss it. Maybe this is another show. No, it's uh, okay. but um, it's okay. In terms of the, the economic ramifications uh, that violence has, um, that the prison system has, um, people don't really talk about it. They talk about how much you know uh, people that have committed violence. You know how much they cost uh, uh, society. Um, listen, the prison system makes a lot of money, also in terms of how many people that they employ, mm -hmm. how many people that are taken out of the job force, mm -hmm. okay, because now they're tagged with a record, mm -hmm. with a felony. They're not allowed to work. And so you want to talk about um, it's uh, the butterfly effect or the domino effect. Once somebody has a criminal record and they do that background check and they're not allowed to uh, get a job mm -hmm. to help themselves, to help their families, by any means, you got to help your family, right? So the likelihood of you making a bad decision is pretty high. And just some quick numbers, because I know time is... It, no, that's okay. It, I'd like to know about this. But you have 70% in Rhode Island, for example, 70% of the people that go to prison do not have a high school diploma or GED. Mm -hmm, mm, 70%. I'm not surprised of that. Of, of that. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood of without having an education, you committing a violent crime is pretty high. It gets even more intense when you think about not just people going to prison themselves, but it's a generational recidivism. 80%, 80 to 85%, right, of the kids at the Rhode Island Training School, for example, they've had a parent, mother or father, do time at the prison. So not only, right, are you having parents do time, you have their children's do time. Mm -hmm. There's an 80 to 85% chance that those kids at the training school are going to, quote, unquote, graduate and go to the prison. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just a Rhode Island problem. No, this, this is, is a, a mm -hmm. national problem. Yes. Yeah, and then you could even talk about, like, uh, uh, the racial implications mm -hmm, of it. Mm -hmm. You know, in a small state of Rhode Island, you have a black population that is below 7%. You have a Latino population that is hovering around 13%, but yet it doubles and triples, respectively, right, to being more than half of the population at the prison. This is nationally, too. This is, this is nationally. Yes, this yes. is nationally, but in the state of Rhode those are specific but see, statistics. this is what critics say, though, until we solve the problem of racism and poverty and lack of education. But I'm wondering, I think you, you're doing great to not wait till it's all cured. Yeah. You, you write out, you can't wait. You can't wait for that to be cured. You have to address it now. Our young kids are dying now through violence. Um, young kids are killing other young kids. Myself, I'm 
33, I'm pretty much safe. It's usually between an age frame of 14 mm -hmm. to 25 where most kids are involved and most kids are getting shot and killed mm -hmm. during that age frame. So them kids are not going to make it if we focus on all them other things to even see a beloved community mm -hmm. happen or, 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 or be built. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to, we're saving lives. We're, we're in that business of saving lives and it's very detailed and it's very concentrated. And like um, Abraham said, it's, it's following through. It's not just following up, and you have to stay on top of them things because and saving sure, lives is something huge. I, I'm, we only have about 30, 20 seconds left, but mm. it seems from just what, the way you've been quoting these statistics that you are seeing changes. You are seeing results, yes. are you not? We are. We are. We are. Uh, from your work. We are. Yeah. We have very good numbers. <laughs> we have very well, good numbers. Well, if you want to say something about that in uh, just a quick um, and Real quick in, in our, our reentry department, because we also have a reentry department that helps individuals come back into the community. 50% usually within a three-year span, people reoffend and go back to prison. Yeah. The institute is at 35%. We have a 15% differenti differentiation from national statistics and state st statistics. And think about the money that we save yeah. up in the millions, towards mm -hmm. the millions, easily. Wonderful. Well, congratulations, both Thank of you, you and the Institute yeah. for Study and Practice. Mm, Thank, of you. Thank, you for Thank you for having You're us. You're welcome. And in closing, I'll say to our audience, in an earlier work by Martin Luther King, Jr., he wrote, the alternative to violence is nonviolence resistance, made famous by Mohandas Gandhi, who used it to free India from the domination of the British Empire. He writes, it is not a method for cowards. It is non-aggressive physically, but it's dynamically aggressive spiritually. Well, at a time of almost epidemic in violence in our culture, it seems to me that it's time that we should have teaching of nonviolence in our conversation about education, and you know here, we call it school talk. <laughs>